So welcome to Roof of the World Tibetan Context. And today's topic is Tibet's climate emergency. And we're welcoming today three scholar activists who have been active over many, many years about uh, Tibet and Tibet's environment. We have Gabriel Lafitte. Gabriel Lafitte is a scholar based in Australia whose blog, ruckle.org, is essential reading, um, providing analysis on impacts of China's policies on the Tibetan plateau, and that's based on decades of immersion in Tibetan culture and many journeys around China. Gabriel mentors and trains young professional Tibetan environmentalists and activists and is, and is an experienced public policy advisor with experience in development, biodiversity and resource management policy. Tenzin Choki, who we have for the second time on our Roof of the World podcast, is a senior researcher at Tibet Watch, which is an organization that monitors and researches human rights violations and policy changes inside Tibet. She provides analysis of the situation to parliamentarians, journalists, governments and campaigners. She has a specialization in environmental science and has also served as a trilingual interpreter and content writer. Dr. Lobsang Yangso was born in Kham in Tibet and studied China's environmental security policies in Tibet and the implications for India for her PhD. And that was at Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi. Lobsang is the, currently the Programme and Environmental Coordinator of the International Tibet Network and has presented numerous papers at international national seminars and conferences in Dharamsala, Delhi, other parts of India, Europe and Norway, elsewhere. So, and that was following her arrival in India, Lobsang studied in Tibetan schools in India. So Lobsang and Choki were both part of a climate change coalition who attended the uh, summit, the recent COP27 summit in Egypt. And they took the important message of the significance of Tibet to the global climate change conversation. And here, here we'll hear Lobsang speaking at the conference to delegates. Dependent. We are all interconnected. His Holiness the Dalai Lama says, we have only one blue planet. So therefore, I think that uh, it's very important to have uh, and improve access and transparency in the scientific research on the whole Tibet's glacier and how it impacts on the downstream countries and also have a collaboration and cooperation with the Tibetan experts in our scientific work. So I finally feel that uh, uh, it's a very privilege for me to, uh, to get this space and talk because I am in exile right now. And uh, on behalf of uh, all the Tibetans who are back in Tibet and um, Tibetan people, the environment defenders, uh, who are still in jail. Excuse me. Uh, sometimes uh, we feel that uh, we are not part of this whole discussion. People uh, remain silent and uh, they decide which issues to talk about. But I feel that uh, we Tibetans are still fighting for the whole occupation and the brutal rule. And Tibetans inside Tibet will continue to protect our environment and we will continue to uh, protect the environment and the grassland. And that not only benefits the Tibetans, but also benefits the whole Asian community for uh, food and water security. Uh, I would like to thank over, uh, and over here, and uh, I would like to thank everyone for your attention. And thanks. 
powerful statement there from you, Lobsang. So I'd like to kick off the discussion by asking the two of you about your experiences at COP27. You were part of an all-female delegation, mostly Tibetan, who went to Egypt and uh, following up on your work in Glasgow um, beforehand um, at the COP before this. So I'd like to begin by asking uh, Lobsang perhaps about your, your experience this time in Egypt and, uh, and why you felt compelled to, to raise this issue of Tibet at the, the, import, the world's most important meeting. Uh, thank you, uh, Kate, uh, for the wonderful question. And uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I over there uh, felt that uh, you know sometimes we we talk a lot about significance of Tibet, uh, especially its ecology, not only for the Tibetans but also for the downstream nations. But uh, even before this COP twenty seven, even at the Glasgow and then uh, even uh, in uh, Paris uh, at the COP twenty one. I feel that uh, if uh, Tibet groups and Tibetans don't speak about Tibet, there is no one uh, at the COP meetings who would discuss or who raise the issue of Tibet at the COP, the, the one of the you know world's biggest uh, climate uh, issue discussion. So I felt that you know um, saying that you know Tibetan plateau is important. And the second is that uh, why uh, there is no discussion about Tibet, uh, Tibet's environment uh, by the other international communities that we don't have an official representation. And uh, I, uh, uh, me and along with my also colleagues, we really uh, focus uh, so much about saying that Tibet does not have uh, an official representation at the uh, COP meetings and because uh, is um, there is only one sole reason for not having any official uh, Tibetan representation at COP27 is because Tibet is still under occupation and Tibet is still going through the whole uh, colonialism and uh, because of the Chinese illegal occupation of Tibet. So we Tibetans cannot have an official representation at the COP27. So these are the issues that we raised because uh, at the COP, everyone talks about uh, having the voices of, uh, of frontline communities, having the voices of environment defenders, and having the voices of uh, uh, the most vulnerable uh, countries and places. But that also, uh, in a way, is also, Tibet is also a frontline community, which uh, has a major impact on the environment. But nobody at the COP um, uh, talks about that. And that sometimes, uh, I mean, makes me a little disheartened. But then since we are in Asia, so like we Tibetans and uh, Tibet supporters and Tibet groups from outside uh, Tibet could attend this uh, events. And we try to raise at the civil society uh, areas or at the site events, but not at the main official uh, uh, discussion. So I think these are the, I think, uh, experiences that I got. And I felt that it's really important for the Tibet and Tibet supporters uh, to have a visibility and to raise the issue of Tibet continuously and make people hear what is happening exactly inside Tibet and why Tibet is important. So I feel that uh, these kind of global climate discussions are really, really significant to talk about issues of uh, climate crisis in Tibet and uh, make people aware that, you know, uh, it is also important for them to include the voices of Tibetans in the whole global climate discussion. Thank you. I'll stop here. So you also pointed out, Lobsang, about, uh, you know, why Tibet's climate matters, why Tibet's environment matters. And you pointed out in your comments that Tibet makes up 2% of Earth's land mass and one fifth of the global soil cover. And you also pointed out about Tibet is the Earth's third pole. It's the largest store of fresh water outside the poles. Arguments that are familiar to Tibetans and to others, but not necessarily to delegates in Egypt. And did you find that there was more 
um, receptivity to your message this time in Egypt compared to Glasgow? Uh, compared to Glasgow, I think uh, even when we, uh, when, when we talk about uh, climate delegations at the COP uh, meetings, uh, there are some uh, uh, groups who do have uh, awareness on the significance of uh, Tibetan plateau, especially at the, especially uh, with the downstream countries like India, Nepal, Bhutan, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and uh, so these uh, delegations definitely have uh, their awareness on the Tibet. But the uh, problem with them is um, they purposely, I think, uh, from my personal uh, understanding, is that they intentionally not mention anything on Tibet because they say that anything to do with Tibet is a, a political issue and uh, it's uh, they consider it as a very sensitive issue. And so they try not to, uh, I think, upset the Chinese government. So even though they are aware of the environment crisis in Tibet, they intentionally uh, never discuss on their panel discussions or they, they don't discuss in the public uh, affairs. But there are other uh, delegates that we could meet, uh, especially uh, the Czech delegations, and uh, we could also meet uh, a Scottish uh, parliamentarian, um, Chris Law, and they are so aware about the whole environment issues inside Tibet, and they do openly talk about it. Uh, so I think uh, it's a, I, I, I kind of get a mixed mix feeling that, because I mean, those who have uh, knowledge on uh, on Tibet's environment, uh, they uh, try to remain silent. And but then in, on a positive or on a positive note, uh, uh, the countries which uh, have uh, like kind of favorable policy towards Tibet are willing to bring the issue of Tibet on the global climate discussion. And the secondly, I think the public, um, the common people and the climate uh, activists and the common uh, people like students and youths, I think they are willing to hear what we have to say. And many of them also feel the similarity, the issues that we also have. They also show concern and so that they say that such kinds of issues are also happening in my country. And we also have lots of human rights violation. So there are lots of solidarities shown by the people that we could meet one to one and that really gives a uh, hope and uh, so make me feel that there is also a I mean, possibility that uh, we need to do more grassroots um, campaign or go more grassroots movement and definitely uh, many people especially the uh, uh, younger uh, generations and the climate activists they are willing to hear about us if we could reach as much as possible on a positive side, we could give the briefing to uh, Nancy Pelosi, and she was very, very happy to hear that uh, there is a Tibetan uh, for the Tibet course, and she took our briefing. And uh, so that was also, uh, I think, a positive side. We really, really hope that her and uh, then her secretaries, they would read the paper and then uh, think uh, or try to have a more action on that. And then Indian Environment uh, Minister Bhupendra uh, Singh Yadav, uh, he also took our briefing paper. So I think those are, those are I think some of them uh, uh, took uh, our briefing paper and so oh, hope that they would read and then bring up some policy recommendations. Mm -hmm. And this issue of the absence of Tibet from COP27 and COP26 and from these important discussions was mentioned by Tenzin Choki at one of the meetings. And if we could just play this clip. Uh, I'm Tenzin Choki from Tibet Watch. I'm here part of a Tibetan unofficial delegation, of course, because it remains under occupation. So uh, because we talked about the wrong side of history, that directly relates to the country I am from. And because, you know, we're also talking about justice and Tibet is warming two to four times faster than the global average. I'm wondering, and also because colonization exacerbates the uh, policies that destroy our world, what can the governments do to address frontline countries like Tibet 
which is the source of water to Asia. It's the water tower of Asia. And it's sort of like, you know, like a planetary, um, sorry, like an island in the sky, if you will, the hot, the hot air that rise go up to the sky and Tibet is at an elevation of average like 4,000 meters above sea level. But we don't have a single Tibetan from inside Tibet, environmental defenders, human right defenders, people who demand freedom and justice here because even sending a single message to their relatives in exile are under risk of getting detained and tortured. So I see this as a researcher as well because people are sometimes very condescending that because I look Tibetan, because I am Tibetan, I am incurably biased. Um, but I have received reports of people getting detained and killed because of that. So what can the governments do to really address that the model, uh, the economic model that the Chinese government is replicating across the world, you know, are also related to the resources extracted from Tibet? Sorry, apologies for the long question, but yeah, thank you for your patience. Choki, you mentioned the Tibetan environmental defenders there. I wonder if you could mention a couple of those people who were working so hard inside Tibet at such great danger. The one defender that stayed in my mind and heart forever is uh, Kunchong Jimpa. So Kunchok Jimba is from Jiru County uh, in central Tibet. He was sentenced to 21 years in prison. Um, and he died in a hospital after being transferred from a prison. Uh, and he died from brain hemorrhage and he was paralyzed at the time. But, uh, and what was the last message that those of us in exile, uh, Tibetan media and research groups, what, what was his last uh, message on his social media account was, and I'll read this, uh, he said, I'm now at the bank of a river. There are many people behind me watching me and I'm sure to be arrested. Even if they arrest me, I'm not afraid. Even if they kill me, I have no regrets. But from now on, I will not be able to give reports. If there is no word from me, that means I have been arrested. So he died uh, under those conditions. Initially, he was detained. He was convicted for leaking state secrets. But what were the state secrets? Passing information about the heartless, ruthless policies that were being implemented in his hometown. The local Tibetans in Duru were protesting, staging anti-mining protests. An old man who was uh, called to a community gathering had too much of it, and he just raised the kata, the ceremonial scarf, uh, up in the air, and it just called for freedom. And then what the government did was just, you know, uh, put the whole community under education. The nice word that they use and ask them not ask command them to raise the chinese national flag so you know there are people in moments like this there are people protesting then there are others who are sending that information because they want the world to know what is happening and this brave you know uh, defender was basically killed you know, and we have many cases of tibetans passing truth to those outside Tibet through, uh, through WeChat, through other ways. And then they are detained, tortured. Uh, and even, um, even after they are treated in such uh, you know, brutality, uh, even their death does not you know, satisfy the government. The whole community is still placed under surveillance. And even after his death, you know, we continue to receive reports about human rights violations that have happened many years ago that we're only hearing now. So, so it's really hard to, uh, for, the, for us, you know, to, as researchers, the Tibetans who have access to these uh, events, but not have a single Tibetan 
like Kun Shou Jingba, who is now no more, you know, uh, come to say what is happening in Tibet. And I think that really speaks to the fact that Tibet still remains under occupation, that even sending a message is not safe. So when we, you know, go to these events and meet people who are either, uh, who are either, uh, too sensitive to hear about our side of the story and reports, or who don't want to hear about it, or who don't even care, it really, uh, it's really difficult uh, because uh, we're speaking to, we're speaking the truth. And then uh, not only uh, Kuncho Jinba is one example, but then we also have Gamma Sandu. We also have many other Tibetans who have continuously uh, protested uh, th through all means by writing, by solo protest, uh, but they are not being listened to. Uh, Tenzin Sherab, a Tibetan who I think in 2013 uh, burned himself alive against China's repressive policies uh, in his hometown of Chikdi, Township in Chumar Zone. It was because there was a large scale uh, policy implementation where the nomads were being displaced from their home pastures. So then self immolated in 2013 against these policies. And then in 2020, Norzin Wangmo, uh, a Tibetan woman, but mother of three, was arrested because she was suspected of sharing information about Tenzin Sherab. So the reason for which Tenzin Sherab self-immolated and the reason for which Norzun Wangmo was arrested, but we are hearing only now in 2022, means that whatever has been happening, you know, and whatever is happened going on nowadays means that there is no freedom in Tibet. And since the occupation of Tibet, it has only gotten worse and worse. And the human rights group and the climate scientists are calling for uh, for these links to be drawn even closer. And even the Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change have mentioned in their sixth assessment report that colonialism and its legacy are worsening the vulnerability of human and ecosystem. And Tibetans have been saying this for decades, but to now have that, you know, uh, in a scientific report, you know, is is it's good. But this is what Tibetans, like all the other colonized people, have been saying this. And not to forget that since World War II, if I'm not wrong, Tibet is the largest country that has been colonized and still remains under occupation, but it has a significance to the weather system, to the water and food security of Asia that even the downstream countries are not opening their eyes to. So that is why, uh, and, but there are still Tibetans in Tibet, like Lobsang I mentioned, who are, who see what is happening, who experience at first hand what it is to live in fear, what it is to live in these extreme weather events, and still be in solidarity with each other, the benefit of which will only be for the Tibetan, not only for the Tibetans, but also to the downstream countries. So to, to tell our story of how we are you know, uh, in exile, amplifying the voices of those inside, and most importantly, to have those inside Tibet to, to come here, you know, to, for them to have the freedom to tell their own story is really important. So that's what um, we were trying to tell in those spaces, in those limited spaces that we have access to. But then it remains a fact that all services, all civil society groups um, are, were being surveilled by the Egyptian authorities. As soon as I landed at the Sharm El Sheikh airport, they were giving free eco SIM cards. I've never heard any telecommunication company giving SIM cards to COP uh, attendees. And then there were human rights groups sharing uh, messages that there is there are security risk to the uh, COP27 application. 
So under such circumstances, uh, you know, how can human rights defenders and environmental defenders access information, share information? So freedom and human rights everywhere is important and Tibetans are demanding for nothing less, nothing more, but what they have right to, to be Tibetans in their homeland, to have the freedom to tell their story like everybody else. So uh, that was my experience. So the experience of being in Egypt and representing Tibet and Tibetans was very different than to the experience of, of being in Glasgow. And perhaps I could ask you both to uh, reflect on how you feel about the outcomes of, um, of COP27 in your views. It was very disturbing. It was, to me, it felt like an escalation because at COP26 in the beginning, there was this billboard prepared outside the uh, the SECC where the COP26 event was held. There was a billboard prepared by Free Tibet that highlighted that there is no Tibetan uh, represent representation at COP26 and that uh, billions in Asia depend on the water from the third pole and Tibet is at the center of it. That billboard was prepared to be shown uh, beside that highway way leading up to C the SECC. But then at the last minute, they pulled off that billboard. So that could have been the spotlight of uh, awareness about Tibet that was pulled off. So, but still, you know, because uh, we were in Scotland and then it was not like Egypt. So we were able to go for protest, uh, take part in People's March, hold panel discussions, um, you know, speak to other groups uh, with, in the streets, in the venue, without that much fear. But then uh, after that event, to just go to uh, Egypt, where from the hotel itself, there were reminders, you know, uh, there were reminders. And then the event was 30 minutes drive away from the our hotel. And then that, that venue was, you know, in the middle of just nowhere. It was far away from the green zone. And then as I explained earlier about those issues with the COP27 application, that meant that without, with, uh, to, to advocate for human rights, environmental rights in a country where there are thousands of prisoners meant that we were also under surveillance. So uh, I think amid all of this, the call for even uh, more basic rights of human beings to have the right to uh, to to clean air and clean water, all of these are ever more important, but those rights cannot be separate. So for us Tibetans, I think it was becoming even more clear that we should be continuing ahead uh, to present a worldview that is different to the hard, you know, uh, scientific ways of um, just physical science is really important, but then Tibetans inside Tibet have many uh, worldviews to present as well. And I think we should be continuing ahead. Lapsang, do you want to add any yeah. reflection for your experience there? Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, from my uh, three uh, times experience of uh, attending COP meetings, what I uh, felt was that uh, I think uh, COP meetings are really, really expensive, uh, you know, conference uh, to be attended. Uh, the flights were very really expensive and even at Glasgow or uh, at Shamashik and hotels were really, really expensive. And I felt like, uh, um, I feel like uh, it's, it's, it's a kind of elite uh, conference where uh, the consideration has not been uh, given much on the developing or the or the poor, poor countries. I think uh, if your organization is not well uh, funded or uh, you know if you don't have uh, enough resources, I think it's it's is really really difficult to attend COP meetings. And the second is that uh, COP meeting has also kind of uh, has become a English medium conference where more every uh, I think uh, conference participants they they speak. Uh, 
English and uh, so it also kind of shows a very elitist uh, conference and I felt that even with the uh, my three of COP meetings I felt that there are not much uh, many people from non uh, English speaking countries or from from Asia specifically uh, so that's uh, uh, another experience that uh, I felt and uh, but then uh, whenever uh, you know after I think Glasgow uh, COP meeting uh, so what I decided for my own uh, I think uh, is that whenever I try to attend COP meetings, I, I go with the least expectation. So in a way that, I mean, makes us uh, or makes me hope that, you know, if we could attend the next meeting, so there is a, there would be a possibility of doing more. So whenever I attend COP meetings, uh, I go with the least uh, expectation. And uh, with this uh, conference uh, in Sharm el -Sheikh or even in the Glasgow, uh, we could, I think, uh, speak at a few site events and met uh, a few high delegations and also environment organizations. We could build a network uh, with the environment activists as, as well. I, and so in a way, I think uh, with not having a much of expectation. So when we at the end coming back from the conference and when we do debrief, uh, we feel a bit of satisfied and uh, but um, no matter how challenging it is to attend a COP meeting in terms of logistic and in terms of not having an official spaces, but I feel that Tibet groups and Tibetans should be there in the every global conference, climate conference, also in the COP meetings, but then also in other environment or other, you know, world discussions on human rights or environment because our visibility is really really important and if we don't go and speak on tibet there is no one who will be speaking about on behalf of us so that's my uh, take on from all these experiences thank you and of course glasgow tibet had quite a high profile with the pathway to, to uh, paris uh, concert with Tenzin Choki, the, the Australia-based Tibetan musician, and Patti Smith and others foregrounding Tibet. So it seems as though the profile was, was of course, quite, quite different on Egypt, and a lot of the focus was on the suppression of voices. But nevertheless, it seems that you still managed to make those alliances and create that solidarity there in, there in Egypt. And another important message that you both took to the conference was one of the consequences of being uh, stateless and Tibetans having no voice except for a very limited one to speak in in their own on their own land is the consequences of China's policies and uh, notably the relocation and the displacement of Tibetan particularly nomads from the grasslands and I know that in your address to delegates, Lobsang, you mentioned the staggering figure of around two million Tibetans displaced from their from their grasslands. And these are nomads who were the traditional protectors, the stewards of, of the grasslands. And um, and I wondered if you could speak to the links that you made with other peoples who are similarly struggling against such such displacement from their land and the consequences of massive top-down uh, party state policies like this? I think uh, that was, I think, uh, really, really a strong uh, point for us to talk about the issue of uh, nomads over there. And uh, with, with that, I think we kind of raised or link with the traditional knowledge and frontline communities how important they are for the environment protection as well. So with that, I think we, we get to, uh, uh, I think, uh, align or we get some space at the indigenous uh, uh, forums or the discussions and uh, their own panel discussions as well. We're saying that uh, Tibetans, uh, 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 Tibetan nomads as the uh, traditional uh, community who have been there on the land for so many years are the ones who protects the land and they have their own knowledge and but then the chinese government not uh, uh, really you know paying uh, attention or the respect or acknowledging their traditional knowledge so i think this kind of uh, uh, you know the narrative and also we did share 
uh, with the local communities and also with the indigenous communities and we get to hear a lot a story on people from Nepal and people from Bhutan sharing about traditional knowledge local communities and so in a way that um, they also share the similar stories and I feel that that's a, that's a really huge there is a huge scope for us to you know bring the issue of Tibet uh, forceful re relocation of Tibetan nomads and its significance of Tibetan nomads for the protection of Tibet's grassland and then bring that narrative with the other uh, international communities and indigenous communities then also talking about or relating with the uh, issue of human rights and not uh, including the local Tibetan communities in the policy making where everyone talks about uh, saying that it's very important for the Tibetan or very important for the local communities to be included in the policy making policy implementation as well so i think these are very important issues and so uh Chuki and my other colleagues they also had the matter a young uh mongolian uh, youth leader i think and uh, so they also shared about the role of nomads in mongolia as well and role of nomads in um in tibet as well so it's, it's very similar issues that people for them to understand the whole issue of Tibet uh, makes really, really uh, interesting and also I think acceptable or uh, easy to understand as well. So yeah, I think the issue of uh, Tibet the nomads at the global climate discussion in terms of uh, uh, the frontline communities uh, not having the Tibetans in the policy making and then also talking about the human rights, uh, how human rights are violated when the government implement uh, uh, so-called the ecological civilization policies or development policies and how that uh, exacerbates the whole climate crisis on the grassland. I think these are really, really important issues and people really, uh, I think, uh, uh, in a way, you know, find similarities and they show solidarities as well. Thank you, Lobsang. Very important to build those, those alliances. And uh, it, it must have felt at times like a very heavy responsibility that you had while you were there. One thing I thought to think in the present moment, because uh, China is implementing the zero COVID policy, and uh, this has been happening in Tibet as well. And uh, one of the thing about climate change directly related to uh, Tibetan experience of nomad displacement and food security is that the displacement policies are uh, making Tibetans lose their uh, food sovereignty. Um, so if you think about how we would be living if there was a zero COVID policy, we would be confined within the four walls and uh, like in France, for example, we had this attestation we had to fill in last year where we are not allowed to go beyond certain kilometers. And then you, obviously all over the world, we were just stacking up food supplies ahead of time. We we're scared of not having food to eat. But then the farmers and nomads in Tibet, I don't think that if there were... Uh, if there were COVID break, COVID policies like that, and if they were living in their own pastures, I think they would have no worries about getting access to fresh food supplies. You know, they would have, they have their herds, they have, they, they have everything, they have their food to depend. Obviously, now the worry about uh, medical uh, assistance and medical, uh, you know, uh, medical doctors, those would be the key issues. But uh, apart from that, what makes human beings survive is food and water. I don't think nomads have any problem at all. And then even going outside their home, they have so much, you know, the population density in Tibet is low uh, compared to mainland China. So even just going outside would be, uh, they, would, they would not be confined with so much, uh, you know, a restriction. So the policy uh, of China to displace nomads means that how nomads and farmers, they confront, you know, uh, how they confront uh, these policies, you know, that they are, they are basically taking away the, the lifestyle which 
would have allowed them much more freedom, even under COVID restrictions. I think it's only us and the cities who are worrying about food, fresh food, but nomads, if they were you know, uh, respected for the stewardship of their land and their adaptability and flexibility, they would not be facing these issues. So um, when the when the nomads were are being displaced and not just randomly displaced displaced also nearby locate near the border areas of India and Bhutan, there are very strategic reasons for that. Global Times has recently reported as well, and they have done it before about how the nomads, after being relocated to this town bordering Bhutan and India, now they are very happy and that they want to defend their homeland and they are patrolling those border areas. But if those nomads were suddenly placed under zero COVID policy within those houses, which the report describes as very clean and orderly, I don't think that, um, I think that their life uh, would be far, you know, uh, more uh, adapt, uh, adaptable and then flexible back in their homeland. And I'm not ruling out the need for medical uh, aid, but then uh, the access to fresh food deriving straight from their livestock. Those are the things that everywhere in the world we need in times of COVID. You know, in Lhasa, when those Tibetans were uh, crying their heart out in WeChat, asking for food that led those old people back in their home that at least they can die eating a zampa, you know. And those Tibetans who were showing the rotten food given by those, uh, I don't know, well, what does that mean, you know, that government can't manage population in urban cities under such surveillance and control with by guaranteeing them fresh food, by guaranteeing them their inner peace, which the Tibetan nomads, being the foundation of Tibetan civilization, have known. But the government is just turning all of that around. So I just thought to contextualize what, you know, the displacement connects to the current COVID policy and how their, you know, their, their skills of living under such thriving, uh, 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 under, living under these cri times of crisis are being eliminated. So that's one thing I wanted to contextualize uh, in relation to food sovereignty and COVID crisis and zero COVID uh, policy. A very important, a very important point. I'd like to to bring in Gabriel um, at this point, and uh, Gabriel has written a very powerful blog on Ruckall, which was about uh, COP twenty seven saying that China has now left the environment room. And Gabriel, I'd like, if possible, you to explain why you believe that to be the case and to reflect perhaps on what we've just heard from, from Choki and Lobsang. We've just heard very uh, reflective, insightful analysis and experiential stories from two courageous women who've been on the front line and are speaking from the heart. That frees me to stand back and try and do some big picture stuff and specifically to look at China's role uh, in COP27 in the climate debate uh, because the big step forward in COP27, despite all of the obstacles and all of the difficulties that both Lobsang Yangso and uh, Tenzin Cherki have mentioned, there was some progress. And the specific issue on which there was progress uh, was that the developing countries of the world uh, of which there is you know over a hundred managed to maintain sufficient 
and consistent solidarity to press the biggest polluters to recognize their responsibility to pay, to actually finance what the world will need, both as compensation for loss and damage that's already being experienced, and not only by the small island states, but uh, just a few months ago by Pakistan, for example. Uh, not only compensation for loss and damage, but also to finance the climate mitigation and adaptation investments that will be needed if the world is to do anything serious. Now, that solidarity and that determination uh, and that clarity of purpose uh, of all of the developing countries succeeded in getting the entire European Union to change quite radically their policy uh, and to concede that they really do need to come up with the money that will enable the world to survive climate change. <clears throat> and that in turn put enormous pressure on the United States, uh, which also has tended to uh, have lots of high rhetoric, but not a strong willingness to actually finance the changes that the world will need if we are at all serious about saving the planet. So that then leaves really big question about China. China is adamant and explicit that it is in no way obligated to pay uh, for loss and damage, in no way is it obligated to compensate uh, the poorer countries, uh, nor, of course, is it willing to allow the world to look at its behavior in Tibet, which includes uh, as we've already been so eloquently told, the uh, displacement of nomads and the collective loss of food security as pastures are uh, turned over to grass and to water provisioning and carbon sequestration uh, rather than being um, active curated pastoral landscapes that are both productive for the nomads and sustainable as they always have been because the nomads not surprisingly as the traditional custodians guardians stewards of such landscapes have always known how to look after those landscapes and and, and not overgraze and they've been willing to be mobile that's what makes them nomads uh, in order to ensure that there is no overgrazing. So I want to focus on what you might call the China, India, Tibet triangle. The, the idea of a triangle really positions Tibet in between the two biggest countries in the world, India and China. And both are not only major players, uh, but China is the world's biggest polluter. There's no question about that. Uh, on every metric you can think of, uh, China's r role as the world's factory makes for extraordinary environmental impacts uh, which this cartoon I think you know clearly shows China consumes more coal than the rest of the world put together uh, China uh, imports processes refines purifies and then exports more uh, copper, 
uh, a whole long, long list uh, of the commodities that make up the modern world. And yet, China has s insisted that it is also a developing country. And therefore, if, any, if there is to be any finance, it should be flowing in to China, not from China. And that is an absolutely crucial point because all of the scientists are now and the economists who are working on this are now saying that the uh, cost of re-engineering the world to uh, become uh, reliant on renewable energy rather than fossil fuel energy uh, is going to cost trillions. That's millions of millions enormous amounts of money which will be needed all over the world. This map shows all of, a familiar map shows all of the countries of the world and yet they're all sort of somehow strangely distorted. The distortion is done in order to show the environmental impact. Uh, of each country and you can see that China is somehow bloated, distended, uh, spreads itself uh, to an enormous size because that size is China's ecological footprint. India is almost sort of shoved out of the way, uh, you know, barely registering. Uh, and, you know, other countries too are rather bloated, the United States, uh, Western Europe, uh, my own country, Australia, um, pollutes far more than its small population would suggest. So China, by insisting that it is a developing country, insists that only those countries that historically for centuries before anybody knew that the climate was warming and that it was caused by our fossil fuel emissions, that they are the only ones who must pay. So China's role is crucial. And yet those who most closely monitor uh, China's behavior are discovering what the rest of us are only slowly waking up to, that China is saying that the rules of the United Nations Climate Convention that were initially drawn up 30 years ago before China became a major industrial power divided the world into developed and developing, rich and poor. And only the rich countries had obligations to reduce emissions and specifically to finance uh, adaptation and to pay climate compensation. So China's role is extremely uh, important at a time when the Europeans are on board saying, yes, we will contribute and we do understand that this is going to be a, a massive investment that will probably have to come from governments. Uh, I, there's an increasing recognition that uh, it's a fantasy to imagine that uh, private investors uh, will be interested uh, in, 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 in doing this because a lot of climate adaptation, especially in poorer countries, is not going to be profitable. So why do the monitors who have been so closely watching uh, what actually happened uh, in the lead up and during COP27, they, no they noticed that uh, two of the world's biggest polluters, two of the world's biggest countries, China and India, uh, failed to send their top leaders to Egypt, 
uh, and this leaves uh, hanging major, major questions. Now, India can, with some good reason, say, well, it's nowhere near as industrialized. It doesn't have the same level of emissions. It doesn't have the same environmental footprint. Uh, it is, after all, while rapidly getting richer, uh, much more of a services-based economy. Uh, but China can't get off the hook like that. And yet China, by positioning itself as the leader of all of the developing world, uh, is somehow saying, you know, therefore we have no liability, which is very, very strange. Now, we've just heard from the front line from two women who were in Egypt at the COP and really did their darndest for Tibetan voices to be heard. So it's really clear why Tibet matters to Tibetans. But to the rest of the world, to India, which shares a very, very long border uh, with Tibet in the high Himalayas. Uh, what is the future? Why should people in India take an interest in Tibet, care uh, about Tibet? Well, this year we have seen in 2022 the most extraordinary conjunction of climate extreme events. We saw in Pakistan, a third of the country underwater, the worst floods they've ever experienced. And at the very same time, there was the most extreme, extraordinary, scary, unexpected, drought in eastern China. So on one side of the Himalayas, you have an extreme of rain, an extreme monsoon. And on the other side of the Himalayas in eastern China, you, you have drought. How is that possible? They are adjacent. They are connected by Tibet. The answer, in fact, is in Tibet. And this diagram, uh, which simplifies the Asian flow of what can poetically be called the sky rivers, where literally billions of tons of water float in from the ocean and create the monsoon. Now, the Indian monsoon does not stop at the Himalayas. The Himalayas are not an impenetrable, impenetrable barrier. Uh, the monsoon clouds uh, get through the cracks in the Himalayas, you might say. Uh, they get into Tibet. But the circulation of winds, as we shift from the, the green to the pink, then becomes a, a circulation that, in fact, is circular. And it generates across China into the Pacific Ocean, through the Philippines and back again, the other monsoon that follows the Indian monsoon. And that's the, the Mayu, the Plum Rains, the East Asian monsoon that sweeps in from the, the Pacific. It sweeps into the Philippines, into Japan, into Taiwan, and above all, into China. And China relies on it up until this year. How is it possible? And it, here again, we see the prevailing winds. We see in red the winds generated by the heating of Tibet every spring, the bare rock 
under intense sunlight because of the uh, altitude of Tibet. The sunlight is very intense. And although we think of Tibet as cold, it actually heats up very rapidly. So the red arrows are the winds of the Indian monsoon being pulled from the Bay of Bengal, the Indian Ocean, and the Arabian Sea across India and Bangladesh, and this year also into Pakistan, uh, and into Tibet. On the right hand of this map, we see the dark arrows of the East Asian monsoon, which is part of the same system. And then on the left, we see the blue arrows of the westerlies, the jet stream that uh, blows across Tibet and sometimes brings rain from the Caspian Sea or the Mediterranean from far to the west or even from the Arabian Sea. Now, the, to cut a long story short, what happened this year was that the, the red arrows were ex exceptionally strong. The blue arrows are now, these days, due to climate change, due to the uh, jet stream wh where this, the westerlies come from, are also unusually strong, and the black arrows failed. The black arrows of the East Asian monsoon simply did not reach China. And that's because the other two are so much stronger, especially the blue westerlies. The, the, all the Chinese climate scientists are now saying that the westerlies are much stronger than they used to be. And that's why Tibet, especially northern Tibet, which is you know, until very recently, until this century, been an alpine desert, getting very little rain. Now it does get a lot of rain. The lakes are overflowing, the rivers are overflowing, the climate is warming, uh, and the Chinese are rubbing their hands because they're saying, well, that makes Tibet a bit more like China. So far as China is concerned, the this is all good. They're not worried about any of this. They get a dividend. They get a dividend of extra stream flow from the melting of the glaciers, from the extra rainfall, from the uh, lakes that are overflowing, from increased uh, stream levels in the rivers. Uh, so, you know, if Pakistan drowns and Western Tibet gets a whole lot wetter, uh, that's not their concern. Their only concern is that sometimes, and we don't know yet whether it's a trend, the East Asian monsoon uh, is in turn uh, no longer reaching inland into China, let alone reaching as far as eastern Tibet uh, because of the strength of the other two. Now, that might just be one year, but it's a very scary precedent, not only for the Pakistanis who suddenly found their entire landscape drowned and their entire livelihoods destroyed, uh, but it's it's scary for the whole world that these dynamics uh, are, are now happening. So to summarize, uh, the rapid heating of Tibet every spring drives the monsoons. Bare rock under intense sun heats fast, despite Tibet's reputation as a realm of cold and draws in the Indian monsoon from the Indian Ocean and Arabian Sea, and then in turn, a month or two later, draws in the East Asian monsoon from the Pacific. Now, today, under climate change, as the oceans warm, Tibet gets warmer and wetter, the monsoons become more intense, more extreme and unpredictable, Sometimes the monsoons are deflected altogether by the strengthening westerly winds over Tibet. This is something new and it's something the world has not quite awakened to, but everybody needs to know about this. The jet stream, the westerlies, uh, those blue arrows, are in fact the same jet stream that cause extraordinary heat in 
uh, Western Canada, in, in the central United States, the jet stream is meandering, losing its strength, and as a result, uh, the whole world is experiencing rapid climate change. So China continues instead, because it's got lots of domestic, economic, and now political problems, uh, not only because of the uh, inhumane climate lockdowns, uh, but because of a whole range of domestic issues. So climate is focusing only on short-term threats to growth, while at the same time reaping a dividend from glacier melt runoff from Tibet into China's rivers. Both of China's major rivers, the Yellow River in the north and the Yangtze in central China, uh, come from Tibet. But China is now preoccupied by security and securitizing Chinese society means enforcing Chinese rule uh, in Tibet uh, as uh, both Lobsang Yangtze and Tenzin Cheki have very eloquently explained. And it starts in school. It starts in free school. It starts with teaching Chinese children to be super patriotic, to wear miniature uniforms, to march in formation, uh, to embrace a militarized, securitized society that is focused on control and uh, stopping all risks. But the more worried you are about risks, the more risks you see and the more risks you must control. Uh, and that's where China is at at the moment. Environment has just suddenly become uh, a luxury issue, an issue for the good times, and the good times are no longer here. The world is in turmoil. Uh, Xi Jinping talks about you know that we are now living in an era experiencing changes not seen in a, in a century. And <clears throat> initially, it sounded like you know he thought this was full of opportunity, but in fact now. It looks like a recognition that China is facing dangers. So, to summarize, China's propaganda output, which is not only uh, at the moment trying to say that uh, COVID protesters uh, are, you know, completely misguided and foolish and criminal and riotous. Uh, but it's also insisting that climate is everyone's responsibility other than China. And China bears no responsibility because China was not uh, emitting greenhouse gases very much a century ago or two centuries ago, even though it is now, even though it is now the world's greatest polluter. And I think that's something that, you know, we need to factor into all of our perspectives, all of our discussions, and I think that's a very powerful reason why Tibet matters very clearly in a very heartfelt way to Tibetans, as we've heard, but Tibet should also matter to the rest of the world, not only because it's a major portion, as Lo Sing Young so said, uh, of the world's land, the world's soils, uh, and, 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 and so on, but also be because Tibet governs the flow of the monsoon rains and creates the major rivers that are sourced from Tibet. So that's my summary of, you know, what one can go into... Uh, much greater depth on uh, and that I've tried to do uh, in my blogs for anybody who might be interested in in looking at these issues in, in a little bit more detail. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel, for this very eloquent 
roundup of the issues. And Gabriel is doing work that no one else is doing at the moment in terms of uh, tracking the impacts. The He plunders Chinese, Tibetan, English sources in great detail to, to work out the big picture of what's happening now. So, so thank you, Gabriel, for that very sobering assessment taking us from the front line to the to the global bigger picture i'd just like to follow up gabriel with a mention of another important meeting that's coming up the un global convention on biodiversity which is being held in montreal from the 7th to the 19th of december um, and this is biodiversity is an equally important and indeed connected issue to climate change that we've been talking about. Um, wild animal species are deteriorating or, disappearing, or disappearing Sorry, by about 2.5% each year. Oh. Habitat loss, pollution, uh, climate change, climate emergency. Um, this meeting only happens once every decade. And the last one was deferred due to COVID. It was going to be held in, in Kunming in Yunnan in China. So, but now it's been moved to Montreal. So it's the it's been since 2010 that there has been an opportunity to renegotiate targets for protecting bio, biodiversity. And so now the next opportunity comes up in December. But it's it's managed by China. China is the host, even though the actual location will be in Montreal. Now, Tibet is a biodiversity hotspot globally. And uh, Kham, which is uh, the home area of, of Lobsang, in fact, is, is, is rich in species and plants and animals. It's one of the most biodiverse areas of the planet and it's totally unprotected. So I wanted to ask uh, Gabriel and Choki to chip in about the significance of Montreal and the biodiversity meeting. And I was wondering, Choki, is there going to be any Tibetan presence there at this meeting in December? I'm not sure if there will be Tibetan uh, presence in the main negotiating table, but then uh, this has been an issue that Tibetan communities have been paying attention to. So there will likely be, uh, you know, Tibetan communities mobilized around the event area to call for protection of the biodiversity in Tibetan areas of Tibet. It is also, if I may add, uh, I think very important in the sense that the the, his Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama, who has in his uh, five-point peace plan asked for the whole of Tibet to be turned into its zone of peace, uh, relates. And uh, of course, he was not only talking about human beings, but then every living being. And in interviews that he gives, he consistently uh, mentions that as soon as he wakes up in the morning, he recites and reminds him uh, the the practice of compassion, which is uh, done. He says by uh, by reminding himself of the verse by Shanti Deva that as long as space endures, uh, as long as long as living beings, not just human beings, as long as living beings remain, until then may I too. Uh, remain to dispel the misery of the world and he recites that and puts it not just he prays but he puts that into practice and every morning as soon as he wakes up he says that so uh, we say that Tibet is uh, land of uh, Avalokiteshvara and then for the biodiversity to be protected I think we need the vision that uh, that Buddhism encompasses that it is not only human beings at the center of this crisis, but in every living being, that although when extreme weather events kill human beings, kill our 
our hard work, the all the livelihoods that we have built upon. But then when animals die, they they are not able to talk to us in a way that we write. But then when they die, they do die and it's very sad. Uh, and in these COP negotiations, sometimes I feel very sad because it's just just a crowd of people trying to make decisions by talking in constructs and terms like the developing countries or developed countries or global north and south, which are really, really important. But then there's so much of the decisions uh, interpreted in terms of money. And, uh, and all the while there are species becoming extinct when the oil companies uh, like the Exxon Mobil, for example, when there was the oil spill, there were sea animals, there were seabirds drenched in oil, not able to fly but dying, you know. And then, how many animals are there in calm who are living and feeling the effect of temperature rise? Um, so, I think the the large um, the holistic vision of the fact that humans, human beings are not at the center of this universe, but then what we have done is, is, is in such a way that we have destroyed, not just, we have brought destruction to everything that we thought was ours, but it wasn't to start with. That There were also other living beings. So uh, for Tibetans, uh, for the Tibetan leader, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, I think his vision of compassion really encompasses, of course, uh, as a Tibetan, as a Buddhist monk, but also as a human being. But the fact that as a human being, we also need to think about all the other living beings as well. I think there could be no better place to end than a reminder of His Holiness's message and the importance of compassion for all living beings and his Shanti Deva prayer. So I'd like to conclude there by thanking all three of you for your, your courage, your eloquence, and speaking to these issues and all of your valuable work. So Gabriel Lafitte, Lob Sang Yangso, Tenzin Choki, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Oh, dear.